Okay, the live stream on YouTube has already started as well. So I think uh, while people are joining, let me uh, uh, welcome everyone on behalf of uh, uh, Cardiovascular Research uh, and uh, myself and on behalf of uh, Council for Basic Cardiovascular Science of the European Society of Cardiology, uh, led and uh, chaired by Christian Weber. Uh, welcome to this year's uh, Cardiovascular Research Discoveries and thank you for joining us uh, today. Uh, when, where we will have an opportunity to hear a very interesting uh, uh, talks and discussion uh, between Professor Constantino Iadecola and uh, Professor Daniela Carnevale on determinants of cognitive impairment in cardiovascular uh, disease. Uh, welcome, Constantino, and uh, welcome, Daniela. As uh, always, uh, the format of, the, um, of our discussion is the initial talk by Constantino will be followed by a slightly shorter talk of, on, of Daniela, and then a common discussion to which we are uh, uh, strongly encouraging everyone to participate uh, in. Um, let us start uh, uh, our uh, uh, webinar and uh, let us start with the first uh, presentation uh, from uh, Professor Constantino Iadecola. Uh, uh, Constantino is a director of File Family Brain and Mind Research Institute in Wales Cornell Medical College and uh, uh, is a professor of neurology in Wales Cornell uh, as well. Uh, his research is widely known to all of you, probably, uh, as he, he focused on basic mechanisms of neurovascular function and is a creator of a concept of neurovascular unit. Uh, the, uh, he championed the involvement of neurovascular dysfunction in various neurodegenerative diseases and neurological disorders and the role of innate immunity and the microbiome in ischemic brain injury. He published many papers, most of them in top journals uh, in uh, general uh, uh, medical discovery, uh, such as Nature uh, Family Journals, but uh, also in cardiovascular journals, such as Circulation Research, Stroke and Hypertension. We are particularly honored, uh, Constantino, uh, to have you here today with us. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> So I can go ahead. Yes, please go ahead. Sorry. Can you see my screen? Yes, it's all visible. All right. So thank you very much, Tom, for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, I'm going to be uh, kind of uh, giving you some key points about the major causes of cognitive impairments in the uh, aged, which is, as you know, is one of the major uh, problems we're going to be facing over the next several decades as the population ages and we, we get better at treating acute conditions but then we're still going to be stuck with the chronic uh, conditions which are not so good uh, at, at treating. So um, I will start with the, the traditional view of cognitive impairment in the aged which includes two uh, uh, broadly uh, defined you know, categories which for the past hundred years or so have been considered completely distinct. One is the concept of vascular dementia, which is thought to lead to brain dysfunction and, and damage and, and dementia through vascular insufficiency, essentially starvation of the brain, okay, from the nutrients and so on. This is kind of a traditional view. And the other one is Alzheimer's disease, which is the proto, it was thought to be the prototypical neurodegenerative disease. In other words, it's a problem of the neurons and vessels, you know, had nothing to do with it. And the mechanism of, 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 the, of the brain dysfunction and damage was mediated by, uh, pr uh, you know, proteins that uh, are kind of disordered or misfolded, aggregated, kind of clumping up, clouding up the brain, leading to a neuronal dysfunction on the basis of synaptic dysfunction so that the neurons couldn't talk to each other. And then you, you would have uh, the result of cognitive impairment. <clears throat> now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, the concept of vascular dementia, which really began with uh, Alzheimer himself uh, um, in, uh, um, in the early 1900s and uh, was, uh, was developed over the years um, through a kind of key, uh, um, 
key uh, uh, conceptual advances that I would like you to, um, to appreciate. So the first really conceptual advance occurred 70 years later, um, when uh, Vladimir Achinsky uh, said that the, the concept that Alzheimer had of atherosclerotic dementia, in other words, hardening of the arteries, there's a German term for this that Christian Weber perhaps could, <laughs> could um, uh, roll off his tongue, I cannot. Um, and it, it, the, essentially, it was unclear how this kind of hardening of the arteries was going to get you demented, all right? So Achinsky said, look, what's going on here is that you're going to get, in these people who have hardening of the artery, there are multiple strokes. And that's why they get demented. So he coined the term of multi infer dementia. Unfortunately, multi-infer dementia is not very, very common. And subsequent epidemiological studies, particularly when the CAT scan came along, all right, demonstrated that it was really a minority of patients at that. However, with the, with the imaging coming in, it became obvious that one of the major causes, a very, very frequent cause of cognitive impairment on vascular basis was white matter disease, hardening of the white matter, or kind of uh, uh, um, dying of the white matter that Achinsky himself termed the leukor aryosis, which is really a radiological term. The next step up came also from, from Vladimir, who said, look, if you think about vascular cognitive impairment, vascular dementia, as dementia, uh, having the same criteria that we use for Alzheimer's disease, placing memory at the top and, and inability to perform activity or daily living, we're not going to get, there are not going to be very many patients with vascular disease in that category. So he suggested the concept of vascular cognitive impairment. In other words, all the, the cognitive alterations associated with uh, vascular disease, and uh, particularly uh, the, the psychomotor slowing and executive dysfunction, which were not traditionally considered, you know, part of the Alzheimer uh, um, uh, palette of, of uh, cognitive impairment. And finally, uh, uh, through the, the work of the pioneering work of um, Marie Germain Bousser, the concept of genetic factors, you know, contributing to vascular cognitive impairment with the discovery of the, the coining of the term Ocadacil, which is an arteriopathy, which is a, due to mutation of the Notch 3 gene, which is a smooth muscle cell gene. So you have a, a mutation restricted to the smooth muscle cell that leads to dementia, you know, highlighting the, the, the prototypical vascular lesion that can cause a, a dementia. Now, Alzheimer's disease instead was developed, the concept was developed by Dr. Alzheimer. Um, and for many, for the first 30, 40 years was not considered really a major cause of dementia. However, uh, over the following uh, decades, uh, the, the concept of Alzheimer really captured the, the entire demen dementia spectrum disease. So that, you know, there was no really, vascular dementia became kind of a minority and afterthought. And everybody equated the term of, the, uh, of uh, Alzheimer as dementia. And actually, Achinsky said, you know, in, a, in one of his uh, many papers said that this was a process of Alzheimerization of dementia. In other words, everything became Alzheimer's disease. And to this day, if you ask people what Alzheimer's disease is, they're going to know it. But they're not going to know what dementia is, or they think they're going to be different. So Alzheimer pathologically is characterized by, at, by the end of the, of the disease uh, course by profound atrophy of the brain that gets shriveled up, all right, and the deposition of amyloid plaques, vascular amyloid around the blood vessels, and neurofibrillary tangle. These are the pathological hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. Now, over the past few years, however, it's become obvious that Alzheimer's disease is not the whole story in, in, in uh, cognition uh, alteration in the age. Because if you look at the clinical diagnosis, at least as it was done in, you know, until a few years ago, now we have a much better tool to, to, tools to diagnose it. 70% of patients were thought to have Alzheimer's disease. By at pathology, when these guys die, all right, and you do the, the pathology, only a fraction of them will have pure Alzheimer pathology, which is plaques and tangle. The majority of them will have a mixed picture, vascular uh, uh, alterations, as well as Alzheimer pathology. So mixed dementia is really the major cause of dementia of the elderly. Now, one of the interesting features is that the latest kind of molecular advance 
that has occurred in Alzheimer's disease came from, from this proteomic study that was published a couple of years ago, and in which they did a, a study of, of the ROSMAP uh, um, cohort in Chicago, and they did they uh, uh, looked at the correlation between intracranial atherosclerosis, okay, which means circular willis, large cerebral arteries at the base of the brain, and PL arteries on top of the brain, was was a, thought to be an independent pathogenic factors in Alzheimer's disease through mechanism that at least as inferred by the proteomic study were very overlapping with the one of the prototypical uh, neurodegenerative uh, protein, which is tau, all right? So now we are back to the hardening of the arteries that Alzheimer was thinking about you know, in 1900 as the latest kind of advance in the field of the overlap between vascular and neurodegenerative factors in disease. Now, the fact that the, the blood vessels have something to do with brain health shouldn't surprise anybody because the brain needs a continuous and well-regulated well delivery of blood because it does not have any fuel reserves. So it needs to be supplied on the fly by these vessels that deliver the blood to the different region of the brain. And so there, is a, there are several mechanisms in the brain that make sure that always happens. One is called neurovascular coupling, which is the ability of neurons to tell the blood vessels that they are working hard, all right? And they need more blood, more glucose and more oxygen to really satisfy that increased energy needs. And this is a very important sp spatial and temporally accurate phenomenon, which is at the basis of functional brain imaging. The other mechanism is called autoregulation. The brain shares with a number of other organs in which there is more or less a, a range of, of blood pressure variations in which there is no change in blood flow. Now, this is called the plateau. Uh, and th there is a lot of controversy these days, you know, how big this plateau is. Some people saying that doesn't exist. <laughs> to some people saying that it's like, you know, it's 80 millimeter mercury. Probably the truth is somewhere in between and uh, has to do a lot of the way you look at this phenomenon. Uh, but th the fact is that we, with the autoregulation, we, the brain is able to maintain a buffer of independence between changes in blood pressure, which are the major driver of blood flow, and the, the, uh, the blood flow itself. So then you, when we stand up, you know, we don't pass out <laughs> because the, the autoregulation kicks in and helps us you know, maintain flow. And then there is the endothelial cells that line the blood vessels of the brain. They are very specialized. They are different from endothelial cells in the periphery by the presence of tight junctions and by the paucity of transcytosis, which is the ability of the endothelium to transport through vesicular transport agents. And uh, the, the transcytosis is actively inhibited in the brain by a specific factor that suppresses it. So it's really a very, very smart cell that is able to regulate blood flow by releasing potent vasodilators, like, for example, nitric oxide. And we're going to talk about endothelial nitric oxide a little bit later on. So these factors work together to make sure the brain always gets supplied. But there is also other things happening in the brain through the vessels. For example, trophic support of the blood vessels, that the vessels release brain-derived neurotrophic factors that feed the neurons and keep them alive. And do it the other way around, neurons generate vascular uh, growth factors that keep the vessels alive. So there is a symbiosis between the two. Immune surveillance occurred mainly through the blood vessels and perivascular spaces. T cells and monocytes can enter the brain and leave the brain through the, uh, the perivascular space, sometimes through transcytosis. And also a later, uh, uh, an aspect which has become very popular now is waste remo removal. The brain generates a lot of garbage then it needs to be get out. For example, it generates a beta and tau in a normal state. Synaptic activity leads to the release of a beta and tau. So the reason why we don't all get demented before our time is because we are able to get rid of it. And how do we get rid of it? through the blood vessels. At least a third, 30% is really through a, a, a vascular, transvascular, perivascular clearance. So when the vascular risk factors act on this control mechanism leading to dysfunction, that ev eventually enters into the, the concept of, of brain dysfunction and so on. Now, how do cardiovascular disease produce dementia? 
Well, there are several ways. One is, for example, you could have a single stroke in an area of the brain, which is critical for cognitive function. For example, the anterior thalamus or the frontal lobe. If you have that, you could have dementia on the a, on a basis of a single, very small ischemic lesion. Or you could have a lot of strokes in the brain that kind of mess up the, 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 the gray matter and the white matter so that the neurons, that is no longer brain power to perform cognitive function. And this was the concept that Dachinsky uh, introduced. But it turns out that the most common cause uh, is this leukoariosis or white matter disease also called, caused by so-called small vessel disease, the major cause of which is hypertension. Indeed, hypertension is the worst thing that can happen to the brain. For example, hypertension promotes atherosclerosis, leading to carotid occlusion or stenosis that leads to hypoperfusion dementia. So the entire blood flow to the brain is kind of shut down. Hypertension leads to microbleeds and microinfarcts, microscopic, microscopic lesions that now we can uh, look at through high field MRI uh, approaches. But the prototypical lesion that hypertension causes is called lapoalinosis, which is a process of alienization or kind of dis solution of the vessel wall occurring in a very peculiar region of the, of the brain called subcortical white matter, which is at the, at the border zone of two separate arterial territory. It doesn't quite get enough blood at all times. And uh, these arterioles that feed this region, they are terminal arterioles, so there is no possibility of collateral circulation. And so when you got something like this, happening here, what you get is really white matter disease. And that, that, so you have essentially a, a disconnection of the, of the fibers that connect the different brain regions. And you have this disconnection syndrome, uh, typical exemplified by, for example, psychomotor slowing, all right? So everything gets, small, gets slower, the thinking is slower, the movement are slower because the connection are not there anymore. So the, the neurons have to find alternative pathways, you know, to get to where, where they want to send the signals. Studies, you know, in animal models, mainly in the angiotensin model, have shown that vascular regulation is profoundly impaired by, by hypertension. And so functional hyperemia, which is the neurovascular coupling business that I told you before, the ability of neurons to increase blood flow is attenuated when you have high blood pressure, like in this case, in this model. And then if you keep the, 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 pressure, the um, uh, hypertension going for a while, the mouse becomes cognitively impaired. But also humans with hypertension have neurovascular dysfunction. So this is a study in which the flow in the posterior cerebral artery which is an artery that supplies the visual cortex, was measured during visual stimulation. Okay, so it's a, it's a little bit like what we were doing in the mouse with functional hyperemia, doing it in humans with, with the visual stimulation. And if you look at the blood flow, the, in the normal, uh, a normal tensive individual, that's very increasing, nice increase in blood flow, which is markedly attenuated in the hypertensive individual. So in the mouse, like in the human, there is neurovascular dysfunction early in the hypertension uh, uh, process. Now, what causes this, this uh, problem is, is a vascular oxidative stress, at least in the, what the model suggests. And uh, uh, particularly in the case of angiotensin, we, we find that angiotensin coming either from the brain in models in which there is an increase in blood flow in, in angiotensin in the brain only, or from the blood in models where there is an increase in angiotensin in the blood, engage a cell which is a, um, an innate immune cells associated with the blood vessels called perivascular macrophages. You can see them here uh, around penetrating arterioles. And these cells are professional free radical producing cells. They can make industrial amounts of radicals and they can produce a really induce oxidative stress that compromises all aspects of vascular regulation. So, you know, both, you know, endothelium responses, you know, neurovascular coupling, autoregulation and everything everything else. Now, what about Alzheimer's disease? Uh, there was, there's been a known for a while that vessels in Alzheimer's disease are not completely normal. The patients with Alzheimer's disease, before they develop the dementia, for example, in the familial cases where you, you know exactly when they're going to get sick, you're going to look, blood flow seems to be reduced ahead of time. Uh, furthermore, Alzheimer's disease and, and, and stroke have almost identical risk factors. 
ApoE4 is risk factor, hypertension is risk factor, dyslipidemia, obesity, and diabetes, and, and so on. But find, one of the major evidence in favor of this ischemic contribution came from the non, non study done in, uh, in Mankato, Minnesota where they looked at the brain of, of nuns uh, um, and they, uh, uh, they donated the brain to, to, to pathology. And they found that if there were very, very few lesions, you know, few uh, neurodegenerative lesions, means plaques and tangles, in, in, uh, associated with very minimal ischemic pathology, the dementia was very much amplified. So it looks like you know, having ischemic damage in the context of mild Alzheimer pathology turned the gain all the way up. And so people became severely demented. So this data suggests that there may be some kind of interaction or synergy between the, uh, the vascular dysfunction and the neuro neuropathological uh, uh, causes of, of, of Alzheimer, leading to the idea that perhaps whatever causes Alzheimer, maybe a beta in tau, in addition to producing neuronal dysfunction, which is very well established, may also induce vascular dysfunction. And as a secondary hit, contribute to the neuronal dysfunction by limiting the amount of blood going to the brain, by reducing the clearance of the beta, by all those things that I told you before that the, that the vessels do. And so a number of years ago, we were, had the opportunity to test this hypothesis in a re recently developed model of amyloid accumulation, the TG2576. This was one of the first mice so-called mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. And what we found is that these mice, when they were very, very young, young adults, already had dysfunction of all aspects of vascular regulation. So these were like, were like pre-symptomatic Alzheimer patients, all right? They also already had a problem with the blood vessels of the brain. And this idea obviously took a while to kind of be accepted until in, in a few years ago, a, a study from the ADNI cohort, which is a large uh, imaging cohort for Alzheimer and minimal cognitive impairment patients, found that the earliest alteration that could be found in these various, various biomarkers, including a beta, including PET, uh, FTG PET, uh, uh, um, connectivity, uh, atrophy, CSF markers. The first biomarker that went awire was vascul the vascular biomarker, <laughs> essentially confirming what we saw in a mouse you know, 20 years earlier, uh, that there was this kind of uh, disconnect between the, the, the vessels and, and the brain contributing to the, to the uh, dementia. Now, the, um, finally, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about salt. Uh, 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 dietary salt has been linked to, to uh, cognitive impairment more recently. It's been traditionally linked to, to stroke uh, and mainly uh, uh, by uh, early studies suggested this was due to high blood pressure. But now there is new evidence suggesting that uh, 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 dietary salt is an independent risk factor of stroke and dementia. And this is an example in which the mini mental state score, which is an index of cognitive function, is plotted as the 24 hour urinary excretion of sodium. So the more sodium you ingest, the more you're going to excrete through the urine. So this is a great you know, uh, uh, index of, of sodium consumption. You can see that there is a, the, the more sodium you get, the, le the less smart you are, all right? So that tells you that there is this problem. The way this happens, you know, no one really knew. So we <clears throat> started the study a few years ago to look at the role of the ISOL diet in, the, in this uh, uh, cognitive uh, function, uh, looking at the vas vascular effects. We use the blood six mouse, which is not salt sensitive. So although the mice got a load of salt uh, for, for weeks and weeks, they did not develop hypertension but they developed a reduction in resting blood flow and endothelial dysfunction, but neurovascular coupling was preserved, which we had never, had, never, had never seen before. Usually everything gets bad, right? Here instead you have some things go bad, some things don't. And so this was very intriguing. But when we did the, the cognitive assessment, including the, the, the ability of the mouse to build the nest, which is activity of daily living for a mouse, the mouse on salt was unable to build a nest. 
So this was a, so me, this meant that the brain was really severely compromised, and so we because of the endothelial dysfunction, we thought that perhaps was the uh, NO was not being made by the endothelial cells, and so in isolated vessel, micro vessels of normal diet and isolated diet, we measured the NO production, and we found indeed that there was a reduction in resting levels and acetylcholine, which is a, an endothelium dependent NO producing agent, was unable to increase the production of nitric oxide. And we found that the problem was with enos phosphorylation, in the salt led to an increase in the inhibitory phosphorylation of, of enos, leading to a reduction in no production. So that if you had gave L-arginine to the mouse, which is a, a way to increase the the substrate for no production, there was an ink, there was rescue of the nitric oxide production by the microvessels and a complete rescue of the cognitive impairment, really linking endothelial nitric oxide production to cognition. So uh, <clears throat> the uh, it took us a number of years to figure out wh why this uh, is happening. And um, what we found was that with the high salt diet, there is a, an expansion of a group of, lymph, of, of lymphocytes in the gut called TH17 cells that make IL-17, which is a, a cytokine that gets into the blood, reaches the brain, and, and engages endothelial cells, the L17 receptors on endothelial cells, activate raw kinase, and leads to inhibitory phosphorylation of endothelial nitric oxide synthase, leading to cognitive impairment. Now, the next question was, how does this endothelial NO deficit lead to cognitive impairment? Because there is a reduction in blood flow or because there is something else going on? Get, you can guess that there was something else going on. It what was on, which we didn't anticipate, was that when you feed the salt to the animals, the mouse develops an Alzheimer protein in the brain, that's tau. So there is hyperphosphorylation of tau in the brain. You know, at the same sites that you see phosphorylated in Alzheimer's disease, there is aggregation of tau, and this is due to a, to a cascade involving calpain denitrosylation, activation of calpain activity, and uh, um, activation of the main enzyme phosphorylating tau, which is CDK5. So if we gave a tau antibody to the mice on a high salt diet, we can completely rescue the, the cognitive impairment. Interestingly, um, without Resting, rescuing uh, the blood flow, which I cannot show you because I my slides are not uh, in sync. But what we found, so the, the essential is that is IL-17 leads to this nitric oxide deficit that leads both to flow reduction and to an accumulation of tau to separate uh, signaling pathways. However, the flow reduction was not really needed for the for the cognitive impairment because if we blocked phosphorylated tau either with the tau antibodies or with tau knockout mice, we had normal cognition despite the flow reduction. So this means that at least at the end, when the mice gets cognitively impaired, the reduction in flow is not contributing to that cognitive impairment, but is really the tau that is contributing to the cognitive impairment. So to conclude then, <clears throat> I've shown you that the, although the, 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 the uh, um, vascular uh, factors and neurodegenerative factors have long been known to lead to cognitive impairment, the, the, the emerging evidence from, from the epidemiology, from basic science, from uh, therapeutics suggests that there is really a major overlap Within these conditions, although these conditions have a, a, a the a separate uh, a pathophysiology at the very very beginning, they kind of seems to converge on the blood vessels of the brain, sharing some fundamental uh, 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 dysregulatory uh, 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 signaling pathways that contribute to the cognitive impairment. So we have seen innate immunity in the case of, uh, uh, of the uh, um, uh, hypertension through the uh, involvement of, of, the, uh, of the perivascular macrophages, the presence of neurovascular dysfunction. We've seen adaptive immunity in the salt leading to accumulation of pitao, which is a classical Alzheimer disease pathogenic factor. So you see that there is this overlap of, of conditions also shown by the proteomic study that I showed you at the beginning, where the pathways through which, you know, atherosclerosis 
sclerosis and tau were uh, leading to cognitive impairment were pretty much overlapping. And so this then, this convergence of factors will lead to cognitive impairment. And understanding the, this interaction and, and being aware that, that the vascular factors alone and Alzheimer pathology factors alone may not be the sole uh, contributor to dementia. It's very, very important to the prevention and the therapy of these conditions because so far we've been treating either one or the other, but we've not been thinking about you know, this kind of convergence that occurs in the majority of the patients with, with uh, dementia uh, that we see in our clinic every day. And I think this is it. I'd like to thank you for your attention. And um, I guess uh, Daniela is going to be next. Thank you very much indeed. And I will pass to uh, Christian Weber to introduce uh, the next speaker. Thank you, Constantino, for uh, really an exciting overview. Yeah, thank you very much also from my side. This was really an inspiring talk. And I'm sure it's going to be also uh, um, followed up by uh, Daniela, who can add uh, some more interesting aspects to this to this story. So, uh, Professor Daniela Carnevale actually graduated in biology and obtained her PhD uh, in neuroimmunology and neuroscience at the Italian Institute of Health in Rome. Um, and basically, this is associated with the Sapienza University of Rome also. And uh, where she's also then fairly soon becoming a full was becoming a full professor. Uh, of neuro and cardiovascular immunology, so epitomizing basically the topic that we're just uh, talking about. And uh, she has been uh, excellently funded, uh, obtained an ERC starting grant, uh, which is always sort of like a, a signature grant for, for, for young uh, uh, uprising uh, stars in, in, in science and, and medicine. Uh, and also an ERANET CVD uh, framework grant. And her research uh, is focused, uh, as you would expect, on the uh, role of the nervous system in controlling and modulating immune responses and immunity in hypertension and also in other related cardiovascular diseases. And we, uh, as of late, had the pleasure of uh, collaborating on a very uh, interesting and intriguing story that is hopefully soon going to come out in, um, uh, in, in nature, where we have basically uh, uh, had without basically her input would never have uh, succeeded in uh, uh, showing that the neural activity is actually important in also driving uh, atherosclerosis uh, through some interesting uh, neuro circuitry. Uh, and with this, I hope, Daniela, that you also have a very nice uh, story to show. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, <clears throat> thank you for inviting me in this uh, uh, interesting seminar. And um, during uh, my, we have heard, already uh, heard about uh, how cardiovascular disease uh, impact uh, the brain uh, cognitive function and can lead eventually uh, to dementia. And during my talk, uh, I will try to focus uh, on um, uh, especially on how uh, cardiovascular disease can, uh, and in particular hypertension, can lead to uh, target organ damage particular, with particular interest into the brain. But uh, I will focus on the, the possibility to have an early detection of uh, signs of uh, presymptomatic damage into the brain, and uh, because this could be particularly important in the management of uh, patients. Uh, we know that uh, chronic high blood pressure typically challenge lots of the tissue in the periphery and in the brain as well. Uh, and um, while in the past decades, we have developed a lot of tools to monitor the progression of target organ damage at various peripheral districts. For example, we know that through echocardiography and very sophisticated analysis like myocardial strain, we can detect the early marker of uh, myocardial alteration, myocardial contractile dysfunction, as shown here in this schematic representation of alteration of myocardial strain. And this is particularly important because it uh, can help us in identifying patients that are at risk of developing uh, systolic dysfunction. And uh, hence, it can help in uh, treating uh, these patients. We have also similar approaches uh, to monitor the progression of uh, uh, renal uh, damage. For example, we can do routine analysis for chronic kidney disease in patients affected with hypertension at different stages of the disease 
system by monitoring uh, creatinine in, in the glomerular filtration rate and so on. And uh, also vascular dysfunction in the periphery can be easily monitored through non-invasive tests for vascular function. For example, we can uh, control the elasticity of large and small arteries. We can control red retinal vascular changes that uh, typically reflects microvascular alteration. We can monitor the carotid artery intimal media thickness that is a, a, a sign of progressive damage to large arteries. But uh, uh, the approach to the cerebral vasculature, as we have already heard before, is particularly challenging because while we have uh, uh, tools that allow to, um, to monitor the progression and the onset of acute brain injury, for example, stroke, that is uh, the most commonly known condition, it is uh, uh, more challenging to monitor and to uh, control the progression of the subtle uh, damage that uh, chronic condition of uh, chronic cardiovascular risk factor, like chronic hypertension, can have on the brain. And uh, then only in later stage, it can evolve toward dementia that uh, typically has uh, all marks that are clearly uh, recognizable by uh, with the clinical uh, approach. And uh, so our, well, the first question that we uh, asked in the past uh, decade in our group was to find uh, a way to study in patients early marker of um, pre-clinical, pre-symptomatic uh, uh, hypertension-induced brain damage in patients. And uh, to, to do this, we expect we exploited the especially advanced the brain neuroimaging. And the other thing was to couple this um, marker of presymptomatic damage in patients to uh, recapitulate these tracts in animals in experimental models of the disease. Because the idea is that we can have a, a, like a picture of what happens in the brain of hypertensive patients in this presymptomatic stage in animal models in order to test uh, therapies that can help in uh, uh, counteracting uh, in uh, uh, the, the progression of brain damage. Um, and just to, uh, um, to give an idea of one of the first studies that we did and that helped us in understanding what happens in the brain of these patients that uh, have no, no uh, overt uh, sign of uh, brain damage, we basically selected a population of patients that, uh, um, uh, that were screened for hypertension and that had an age uh, that was between 40 and 65 years because we, we, our aim was to avoid the, the inclusion of aging uh, people that uh, can have also the, uh, the confounding factor of age. And then we excluded also the major neurodegenerative and uh, acute neurological diseases, also uh, other um, secondary hypertension, renal failure, and so on, to basically have patients that uh, are hypertensive and uh, can be be compared to normotensive and uh, monitor their, um, just to have a picture of, a, of their brain damage uh, through uh, brain imaging. The first thing that we did was a conventional scan with MRI just to exclude patients that have a sign of brain damage. So these patients can be classified as normal patients with no sign of damage. But, uh, and this is a typical um, uh, character, clinical characteristic of this uh, uh, subset of patients that has no end organ failure. Uh, but but when we uh, do a, 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 a different type of uh, brain imaging that is basically exploiting MRI, but not the conventional scan, but fiber tracking that can help us in um, monitor what happens in the white matter tract that connect different brain areas and basically give us an idea of microstructural damage that is impossible to be um, to, to emerge with the classical conventional brain scan. We identified the three typical tracts that are altered in all these uh, patients with uh, asymptomatic uh, brain damage. These tracts are the anterior thalamic radiation, the superior longitudinal fasciculus, and the uh, forcep minus, the callosal fibers. Basically, these uh, tracts were altered in this population of hypertensive patients that when were tested for their cognitive function showed no sign of dementia. However, if we uh, subject these patients to a, a, a more subtle uh, uh, battery of a, a neuropsychological assessment, like the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, uh, it uh, came clear to us that there are some subscale of these uh, um, 
this kind of uh, uh, neuropsychological test that uh, highlight uh, some subtle alteration in these patients. Basically, these patients have uh, a, a subtle alteration of executive function and memory functions that couple well with the uh, brain tracts uh, highlighted by MRI. This is a correlation analysis that gives just uh, a, an idea of uh, um, the fact that the progression of white matter microstructural alteration uh, is reflected by the progression of hypertensive duration in these patients and the degree of cognitive impairment. Through another um, kind of uh, brain uh, uh, imaging, uh, that is the functional MRI, that basically monitor not the uh, structural alteration, but the functional alteration in a resting state, so in unchallenged activity of the brain of these hypertensive patients, also emerged another tract of alteration. This is a quite a complex analysis, but basically what we identify was a network of uh, um, brain areas that connect with uh, the frontal lobe and also with uh, uh, the visual network that are altered in the hypertensive patients as compared to the uh, normotensive uh, uh, control. The interesting thing is that if we uh, take together uh, all these kind of uh, uh, markers, so the microstructural white matter alteration, the functional MRI, and the cognitive assessment, we can have like a composite biomarker that give us an idea of the stage of uh, progression of this uh, sample of patients that are basically identified uh, in our routine clinical analysis as a patient as it, as in Automatic patients with no end organ damage in the periphery and in the brain as well. But uh, this analysis tells us that this patient can be at risk of developing dementia. And through um, a machine learning approach, we can also have uh, a, a prediction of uh, the risk of these patients uh, of uh, evolving toward dementia. And having tools that uh, uh, allow us to um, counteract the progression toward dementia could be an available way to, um, to treat these patients. Unfortunately, we do not know at, uh, uh, at present if there are different kinds of antihypertensive therapies that can control in a, uh, in a better way the progression of the disease, and the uh, experimental model can help us in, uh, um, in, in finding new therapeutic strategies. For this reason, we modeled in mice in the past years uh, um, an hypertension-induced hypertension cognitive impairment model that is basically obtained in wild-type mice with no uh, uh, the susceptible genetic background. This is the 557BL6J uh, mouse that we have already heard before. And uh, basically, we uh, induce hypertension in these mice, not with angiotensin 2, uh, but with uh, a, a mechanical challenge that is obtained by transverse aortic quartation between the two carotid arteries and imposes a severe degree of high blood pressure to the brain. The interesting thing is that this model during time um, progressively lead the brain to a cerebral hypoperfusion that uh, was measured um, in different way. And uh, the other important thing is that this is a, a global hypoperfusion. Basically, the two hemispheres uh, are subjected to the same challenge um, because uh, uh, we monitored both the right and left hemisphere and cerebral blood uh, flow was the same, uh, was reduced all the same. Um, Interestingly, in this uh, model, we can also recapitulate some tracts uh, that are typically observed in experimental models of Alzheimer's disease, like the amyloid uh, deposition in uh, typical brain regions that uh, can, con can be uh, involved in the cognitive processes like the cortex and hippocampus. We also observe the neuroinflammation in terms of microglial activation and alteration of the, um, the cerebral vasculature. Here, um, we can see a reduction in capillary density and in the reduction in pericyte coverage. Um, but the important thing is that these models also develop cognitive dysfunction in a way that is similar to what we observe in pre-symptomatic uh, hypertensive patients. These mice were tested with the Morris water maze that is basically a test that allow us to uh, monitor the learning abilities of mice. Typically, they have they, they, these mice swim in a pool uh, where they have to locate the position of a platform. And the normal mice, normotensive mice, typically 
improve their uh, time spent to reach the platform over time during the different tests as shown here. A an hypertensive mouse uh, typically have an impairment of these learning abilities and over time uh, he spend the same time to reach the platform, indicating that he, he, he doesn't learn where the platform is. And at the end of this trial, uh, we also can test the retention of memory, that is uh, something that is uh, related to consolidation of memory uh, through the probe test. Basically, we remove the platform from the pool and we let mice uh, spend uh, a minute of the swimming uh, time in the pool. Normal mice typically spend most of the time in the place where the platform was located, like in this heat map. We can see that mice spent most of the time here where the platform was. But mice with hypertension, the tuck mice, do not remind where the platform was and as a random swimming into the pool, as shown by this heat map, indicating that hypertension is able to induce alteration of learning and memory function of these animals. But uh, is this uh, um, reflected in some alteration uh, in uh, the brain? Uh, on, in the brain, we have seen that there are uh, deposition of amyloid peptides, neuroinflammation, and so on. But we never identified the signs of real neurodegeneration. But when more recently we subjected these mice to advanced neuroimaging through seven Tesla MRI scan of the brain. We observed that these mice develop a sign of wet matter alteration that is uh, um, quite similar to what we observe in pre-symptomatic uh, hypertensive patients. Uh, we have here a representative image and a quantitative analysis of the alteration of wet matter um, diffusion properties um, in some specific brain regions that are dense of wet matter. Uh, this is the quantitative analysis that basically reflects a microstructural alteration of the integrity of white matter that can be prodromal of uh, uh, later development of neurodegeneration. Uh, and in perspective, this mouse model can be particularly useful because uh, we can recapitulate the stage of presymptomatic patient and uh, try to uh, exploit this mouse model to, uh, uh, to try new therapeutic strategies or to uh, monitor what happens with different antihypertensive drugs already available and used in clinical practice. But um, in order to use this experimental model to investigate the cellular and molecular determinants of hypertension-induced brain damage, we can also um, uh, um, uh, try to understand what happens when the, the impact of high blood pressure in the periphery that we know very well to be able to activate that immune response as well uh, can uh, deal with the brain homeostatic uh, milieu. We know that the brain has been considered for a long time as an immune privileged organ, but we know also that during challenges there is a continuous exchange of cells uh, of leukocytes that can uh, cross talk with the brain resident cells and are moved from a peripheral immune reservoir. And um, uh, in, in one of the most interesting thing is that uh, we know that hypertension is critically regulated by lymphocytes. And normally lymphocytes in the resting condition of the brain are not circulating in the cerebral circulation. We know, for example, that CD8 T cells have a key role in high blood pressure in response to angiotensin II, for example, but also other challenges. Since mice that are not caught for CD8 T cells are protected from high blood pressure and for damage in uh, peripheral vascular districts like uh, the renal vascular districts or also endothelial function in peripheral arteries. But we do not know uh, at this stage what happens when uh, um, these cells can uh, come into contact with the brain, um, uh, um, the brain immune milieu, the neurovascular unit. We have uh, uh, already heard in the previous talk that uh, there is a complex organization of resident cells of the immune system that continuously cross-talk with uh, uh, neurons and vessels in the brain. And uh, we have found that when we challenge mice with DAC, with TAC, so we induce high blood pressure in mice with the transfer aortic quartation, we have an increase in several leukocytes in the periphery and in the brain as well. This is a fax analysis of the brain. And also CD8 T cells are increased in the brain of TAC mice, uh, letting us to hypothesize that these CD8 T cells can be recruited by peripheral reservoir and came into contact with the, the milieu of the brain where they can um, realize and establish a, a brain vascular immune interface and cross-talk 
with the resident cells. Uh, and uh, in order to find a way to study this direct interaction of the brain uh, and uh, arteries and the peripheral recruited cells, we uh, developed a system of a pressure myograph that basically can be modified to keep vessel alive for different days where we can culture cerebral arteries in the presence of these uh, cells. I won't go into the detail of this system, but basically the idea is that we can uh, have CD8 T cells or other immune cells of interest that we can uh, isolate and purify from hypertensive mice and challenge uh, resistance arteries and, or uh, cerebral arteries uh, in this system to look at what happens when these cells are in direct contact in the absence of any other confounding circulating effect with these arteries. And as shown here, CD8 T cells are able to increase the myogenic tone of these arteries that is an important property that can control brain autoregulation and cerebral blood flow. And also we can monitor what happens in the, uh, the, the, the genes that are differentially expressed in these cells and the possibility to look and to, uh, uh, to discover new key pathways that regulate the brain vascular immune interface can help in finding new uh, targets that can uh, help in contracting the uh, challenge that the high blood pressure imposes on the cerebral circulation in the crosstalk between the periphery and the brain. And with this, I have finished. I would like to thank uh, uh, all the people from our group, and in particular, Lorenzo for the imaging study, Sara for the fax analysis, and Maria Luisa for the stainings. And I would like to thank uh, all the granting sources and uh, you for the attention. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for the beautiful presentation. So um, we have lots of questions already in the uh, in the chat. Uh, maybe uh, I, I can start with a with a question uh, also to Dan Daniela. Uh, there there was one question whether there is actually differences also in amyloid deposition that you see in in the hemispheres uh, in your TAC uh, model of hypertension. Um, have, have, have you looked at that and uh, also whether the white matter lesion alterations uh, are linked to an alteration of oligodendrocytes uh, or neurons or both? So those were two questions to that model. Well, the amyloid deposition the, the was um, present in both hemispheres, and there is no difference in the, uh, although we have a challenge that is uh, at the beginning, uh, imposes a different uh, uh, pressure, uh, high blood pressure on the one side and uh, low blood pressure on the other side. In the in the brain, uh, there is an homogeneous uh, hypoperfusion, and uh, also the all the, uh, the alteration that we observed in terms of amyloid deposition, but also, for example, microglial activation was uh, uh, the same in both uh, uh, hemisphere. And regarding uh, oligodendrocytes, we never uh, investigated their involvement, uh, uh, but we never found at this time point that is after uh, four uh, to eight weeks after TAC, we never observed any sign of real neurodegeneration. Thank you. I think Pasquale and uh, AJ have some questions. Pascal, you go ahead first. Okay, thanks. Um, I wish to thank both speakers. Very, very nice talks. I have one question for Constantino. You have clearly shown that inflammation is leading to microvascular dysfunction and is important. Is there any appetite or any data uh, showing uh, what anti-inflammatory systemic treatments like uh, canakinumab or colchicine or blocking IL-6 can have on uh, on cognitive dysfunction, or is there any trial ongoing in this direction? Well, you know, the, there is some data in Alzheimer's disease trials <clears throat> uh, in which they, they looked at non, non, non steroidal anti inflammatory, and there was a signal for a while and then they went away. <clears throat> so there's a, there's a lot of smaller studies that showed effectiveness. But then when you they did the, the big one, you know, didn't pan out. That's been kind of, it's typical of all neuropsychiatric diseases. Uh, that is almost a constant. The problem is that 
the, the way we do clinical trials for cognitive impairment now is completely different the way it was done five, six, seven years ago. The main realization has been that you got to get the patients before they get sick. So there is a tremendous emphasis on the biomarker. Um, and the, in the United States, you know, uh, as in Europe, there, is a, there are all these networks attempt, attempting to find the, the most valid biomarker that you could use before people get sick. Because they know at the time when they get sick, you know, no longer is effective. Now, the problem with cognitive impairment associated with vascular factor is that the link with dementia is shifted by 20 years. All right. So if you measure blood pressure to a demented individual, you most likely is going to be low. Um, and that's been, you know, uh, confusing the field for years. All right. So they used to say, oh, vascular factors, you know, have nothing to do with Alzheimer because they're hypotensive. They, you know, but, you know, they're hypotensive. Why? Because they don't eat, because they don't drink, because they don't have, they have uh, you know, uh, autonomic dysfunction within the brain. You know, so that's been a tremendous confounder. In hypertension, you know, you get it's midlife hypertension that really correlates with late life dementia. So it, this complicates the, 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 the assessment, you know, uh, completely. As far as some of these medications that you mentioned, the, 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 the group of patients that you would need to do to get a signal out of it would be too large to, to really be able, for example, FK506, all right, that, that is a calcineurin inhibitor. It's been very, it's tremendously neuroprotective. Uh, and there is some evidence that may actually work in some st setting stroke, for example, there was a, a couple of papers and so on. But, you know, when you go to a, there is not enough number of patients to justify to really do, uh, some of these drugs are toxic. <laughs> so yeah, you, you end up giving, you know, a, a drug to someone who's essentially healthy, <laughs> hoping that it's not gonna, it's not gonna get dementia, you know, 20 years down the line, you know. So that's that's a challenge that is being, uh, uh, that is plagued the, the field, uh, absolutely. So you put the, the finger on it, yeah. Thank you. And maybe partially linked to that is a question from the uh, question from the chat uh, regarding the link between uh, dementia and, uh, uh, and cognitive impairment and health path. Uh, can you comment on, uh, on on this and on potential sort of link to, to rarefaction that uh, Khalid is, is, is asking in, in the chat? Maybe Daniela can address that. In a way, TAC is a model of, uh, yeah. uh, of, of overload, yeah? Yeah, at, at this stage uh, and in this particular strain, the C57 uh, BL6J, we have... Uh, uh, with this severe pressure overload, the ejection fraction is completely preserved. And all the, uh, for all the time uh, long that we um, analyzed these mice, we have um, analyzed that four, eight, and 12 weeks uh, after TAC, uh, there is a preserved systolic ejection fraction. They have a mild diastolic dysfunction and a typical uh, um, hypertrophic remo adaptive hypertrophic remodeling. And uh, despite this, they have uh, uh, cognitive impairment. So probably it uh, uh, depends. And uh, we have also analyzed some uh, subset of mice, but I think that this is uh, really something different because when they develop heart failure, the impact uh, on the brain, so they have a, a significantly altered and impaired the systolic function, the impact on the brain can be different. And this is also evident for patients because, for example, in our population of patients uh, that are hypertensive, uh, we excluded those uh, that had uh, uh, reduced ejection fraction because in this case, we uh, I think that we should study a more homogeneous population uh, because the impact on the cerebral circulation can have can be different uh, or, or at least um, can have a different progression. Thank you. AJ? Yes, so uh, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, acknowledge and I appreciate both presentations with their focus on cardiovascular uh, system and Alzheimer's. Having said that, I'd like to emphasize to gain insight into pathogenesis of Alzheimer's, it is essential a distinction be made between those that are primarily due to neuronal diseases from those secondary to vasculature, uh, endothelial function and other, uh, other uh, uh, effects. So 
like any other disease, primary disease must have a spectral. A part of the spectral will be the subtype of Alzheimer's disease that occurs early in life and largely familial, and therefore there's a larger genetic component to it. And those are the models, human conditions that will give you a clear understanding what is the underlying pathology, primary pathology in Alzheimer's disease. I do appreciate that the focus was cardiovascular and that part was missed. But for us to gain, what is the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease? I would like to hear some insight about the early onset Alzheimer's disease that occur in the absence of confounding phenotypes such as hypertension or diabetes or mitochondrial disorders or oxidative disorders and others that may contribute to that. And if so, what are the, for example, penicillin or APOE has been there from Alan Rose's days from 1980s. We still don't know whether they indeed cause Alzheimer's and if they do, how they do it. How much do we know about those primary diseases that are uh, lead to Alzheimer's uh, disease? A lot. <laughs> we know a lot about those diseases because that's, those are easy. <laughs> because you can tell them, you can, there are families, you know, there are mysteries still, but there are families which, in which the, the age of onset is very clearly determined. And that's where some of those vascular uh, cerebral blood flow studies have, have been performed, where you can do them before they get sick and so on. However, the the in so the, the diseases of uh, that you refer to, the, they used to be called presenile dementia. These are familiarly uh, due to genetic to mutations within the the domain of the amyloid precursor protein, without affecting the beta domain. Instead, there is another class of diseases related, which is called cerebral amyloid angiopathy, in which the, the, the people develop amyloid or only around, around blood vessels, in which the mutation is within the beta domain. All right. So those are the two major form of amyloid related. Okay. Now, in the um, in the concerning the amyloid, there is good evidence from uh, a, a someone you know a professor at Washington University who did this study in patients that the problem with with the the uh, um, um, presenile uh, uh, dementias, uh, presenile mutation, you know, amyloid precursor protein mutation is a, uh, a overproduction of amyloid beta because the mutations that, that they uh, uh, have activate the, the pathway that lead to cleavage of a beta from the amyloid precursor protein, mainly the gamma and the beta secretase pathways. And so if you take these cells, you know, they put them in vitro with that mutation, they keep making more a beta. I mean, it's really, uh, that's pretty much it. So the problem instead with the, the, the one we are interested in, which is the late life dementia, 99.9% .9 of the patients, is the problem with the clearance of a beta. The, the, there is no overproduction, but there is failure of clearance. That's where the blood vessels come in, okay? Now, there are mysteries, however, one mystery is nobody understands how you can get tau out of a beta. So the, the classic manifestation of pathological are a beta and tau. Uh, there is, you can have tau without a beta, okay, in, in the so-called tauopathies, like from the temporal dementia, but you cannot have <laughs> a beta without tau. So when you have a beta, you also develop tau. If there are different thoughts about that. So one thought is that a beta kind of promotes the, uh, the, the uh, tau, is a sign of stress, stresses the cell. So the cell in the end starts to make aggregation of tau, which derives from a hyperphosphorylation of tau. And the other one says, you know, they say the other way around, that tau is kind of the, the, um, the initiator of, the, of this uh, process. However, what seems to be more or less agreed upon is that tau is the effector of the dementia. Because you can have lots of a beta, it'd be perfectly normal, but, but have a little bit of tau and, and be severely abnormal. And now that you can measure tau 
and, and, and a beta impatience, amyloid impatience with the scans. And that's now coming out, you know, in which the, the relationship. So we know a lot, there are clinical trials ongoing uh, in these patients who have a, a familial Alzheimer's disease. But it seems to me that old, ro old roads ends to uh, uh, pre-amyloid uh, beta uh, precursor. But how about other, there ought to be other mechanisms besides, you know, amyloid beta precursor mutations and others. The question is, the spectrum has to be much larger than that. Are you, are you also saying that APOE4 increases susceptibility through Alzheimer's through amyloid? Are you saying that presenolin 1 and 2 mutations also do the same mechanism? Or are there diverse array of mechanisms involved? Yeah, so presenilin, as I told you, presenilin is a mutation within the amyloid precursor protein complex, and that leads to increased production of a beta, all right? Production. Amylo APOE4 is the most common risk factor for sporadic Alzheimer's disease. And that the, the mechanisms are four or five different ones. The one that is, seems to be more, I mean, I like best is that it prevents a beta clearance. So once you have, if you are APOE positive, you have a hard time getting rid of a beta and ends up accumulating. Can we, can we link uh, to that? Because one of the uh, participants is asking about uh, the uh, uh, reason for the perivascular the location. Perivascular, of these, yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, is, is, it, uh, is, is there is a possibility that something actually is produced by blood vessels, maybe in response, and it links to yet another question from a participant, maybe it's induced by angiotensin II or ROS. Uh, yeah. that uh, the blood vessel makes the accumulation happen or it's the problem of clearance only? It's most likely in, in the, in, is a problem with clearance. Now, the, this is the human data shows that the, the A beta is made from the brain constantly as you, because it depends on synaptic activity, but you don't, we don't get the mental until we are 90 years old because when we're young, we can clear it, all right? And the clearance of a beta occurs to three major mechanisms. One is uh, peptidases within the microglia that get rid of it. The other one is, is perivascular uh, uh, disposal. And the third one is a CSF disposal. So presumably all of these three things with aging don't, get, don't work all that well, so you end up accumulating. Why does it accumulate in the blood vessels? In sporadic Alzheimer's disease, accumulation of blood vessels because it's around, that's the path. It's like the highway, okay, that gets a bit out of the brain. So the, all the broken cars, you know, will be stuck in the highway, right? Stuck, yeah, so you're going to yeah. have the, the, the bit accumulating around the blood vessels. Now, there is conditions that I mentioned before, the CAA, the cerebral amyloid angiopathy, all right, where the beta is in, in itself is mutated. Whereas in, in Alzheimer, the A beta is not mutated. It's a regular A beta, 40 to 42. With these mutations make A beta very hard to get rid of. And these mutations make them stick to fibrinogen, make it stick to some kind of you know, clotting factors that are involved. And so they end up ending up being uh, 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 stuck to the blood vessels. Now, whether the vessels on itself is gonna make it, is a little bit unclear. Look, you know better than I that there, is, there are systemic amyloidosis, all right? In, in which the brain doesn't care about it. <laughs> uh, so uh, like, you know, the, 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 that's been an argument against, you know, the, the, the beta coming from the blood. Although there is a transport mechanism from the blood to the brain, to the rage receptor that may actually be it's been invoked in animal models but in patients see that's so presumably a beta is not made by the blood vessels uh, the vessels may just be the target of it as it gets removed out of it okay. i think the hypothesis of of the deficient clearance and uh, basically the the, the the vessels actually or the perivascular space being in the way uh, I think that's probably the best hypothesis. And may, may, may I come back to the striking uh, um, data on the salt, salt uptake and the tau hyperphosphorylation? 
because there are also the two questions related to that, whether basically, for instance, in a salt sensitive red model or also maybe in individuals with salt sensitive hypertension, there's a higher propensity to develop uh, dementia or uh, vascular cognitive impairment. Yeah, so tau is more mysterious than a, a beta. We don't understand little, all right? Tau, we understand little less than a beta. And the reason being that is a microtubule associated protein, but no one knows exactly what it does on a microtubule. Um, the, the micro, eventually what's going what happens, and no one knows exactly how, the tau ends up being hyperphosphorylated. Tau in itself is called a disordered protein disordered all right means it's got a it's got not a tertiary structure that you can put your finger on it's extremely uh, um, flexible and when it gets phosphorylated it tends to aggregate to all the tau molecules so you have a process of oligomerization that eventually leads leads to aggregate formation of aggregates that is indisputed that they kind of mess up synaptic function all right so synaptic function is like the you know the the heart beating all right is the essence of neurons they, they got to talk to each other and so when you have synaptic dysfunction then you got what daniela talked about which is this disconnection syndrome all right but then you have one area of the brain doesn't know what the other one is doing and you, you know you get psychomotor you know disturbances and so on the pathways that control memory, which is the hippocampus, are particularly susceptible to this synaptic plasticity that is being so selectively affected by tau. So that's what, so it, it, that in essence is what happens. Now, it comes, tau can come in Alzheimer, you know, maybe because there is a beta that promotes its formation. It can come in a salt because, you know, there is this unique nitric oxide link, you know, it's a problem, it comes from different ways. Now, in disease called tauopathies, from the temporal dementia, um, PSP, you know, progressive subclinical palsy, where the problem is only tau, there there is a mutation. There's a mutation of tau that uh, uh, promotes the accumulation. Or they, they, are, they are related mutation, like progranulin gene, that promote the accumulation of, of tau as well, pretty much like a beta does but the intrinsic mechanism are not clearly delineated yet. And, and, and is there basically a, a correlation uh, in, in salt sensitive disease to dementia and vascular impairment or in, in uh, this red model that someone... Done? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're pushing that a little bit. So if you take, for example, we just published it last year. So if you take a, a, a mouse model of uh, frontotemporal dementia was a mutation of tau, only there is no a beta in this mice. If you do the whisker, if you activate the neurovascular coupling in the, in this mouse, it's severely suppressed, but the endothelium works perfectly. All right, mm -hmm. so that points to the fact that tau is really a synaptic problem. Tau really converges on the synapse, and it doesn't do anything else on the blood vessels, uh, at least early on, except for the secondary effects. Yeah. I, I would have a personal question also concerning the, the, hyper, the, the hyperphosphorylation mechanism. So I, I think you show that it basically the, the, the salt uh, response involves CDK5, which then yeah. mediates the phosphorylation. But what is the precise mechanism for the salt sensing that leads to the CDK5 activation? Or in other words, could you actually directly target that in order to prevent a yeah. salt sensitive response uh, on hyperphosphorylation. Yeah. So in in uh, if we treated the the salt mouse, you know, with CDK5 inhibitors, yeah, you fix them. Mm, okay. Right. So the way CDK that's one of the pathways. There there are two other major. There's PKA and there is also GSK3 uh, beta. So it, everybody's got their favorite enzyme, the phosphorylate style, right? And so uh, uh, CDK5 is the, the one perhaps there is a more, more evidence for. In our case, was a calp in order to activate CDK5, you had to convert a protein called P35 into P25. 
And the protein that converts this is called calpain, is an enzyme, all right? Okay, so yeah. we thought that calpain denitrosylation would activate the enzyme and convert it to P25 that then led to CDK5 activation. Mm -hmm. uh, and these CDK5 inhibitors are being developed is a target of some of these, uh, uh, you know, tauopathies as well as Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a very, very active, you know, area of uh, reserve. There's one very practical question on, on the chat from uh, Professor Wopitsky from Krakow, who is asking about the methods uh, to assess early vascular impairment in the brain in mice or humans is the, you know, the, of course, the, the whisker response that you have pioneered is, uh, is, is, is still uh, valid in experimental models, but is there something uh, uh, up and coming? Is there something being developed? And I think it's a question to both of you. Can yeah. we pick it up early in humans, for example? Are there any biomarkers, radiological or functional? Maybe Daniela can... Uh... Daniela from... Well, uh, in mice, uh, uh, for sure, we, we can... We can have uh, some markers that are non-invasive. Some methods non-invasively uh, can can be non-invasively assessed, and uh, I, I showed also some methods that allow us to study direct function of uh, uh, cerebral arteries ex vivo, and this can be useful to test uh, specific molecular mechanisms or cellular mechanisms that uh, um, can also be. Uh, cannot be affected by the confounding uh, effect of circulating substances, hormonal effects, and so on. And uh, in patients, uh, this is, uh, uh, these new uh, um, approaches with uh, advanced neuroimaging can uh, allow to monitor the uh, vascular uh, the vascular um, reactivity in a specific brain region. We have uh, the uh, some of the data that I showed, for example, that are related to resting state functional MRI, but there is also the arterial spin labeling that can monitor the perfusion of specific brain areas. And this test can also be coupled to, to the um, uh, to specific cognitive uh, task. Uh, this is uh, something very challenging in the clinical practice because you have to uh, monitor the brain imaging and at the same time give some task executive or memory task to patients, but uh, this is possible. And this could uh, uh, give an information of specific uh, function, specific brain areas that are like the, the, the test in mice. So you can do the same thing in humans, but is uh, something really complex in the clinical practice. And from your experience, Constantino, looking into yeah. the future. Yeah, well, there is, the people have been measuring blood flow in the Alzheimer's disease forever, all right? Uh, but they've, they've usually, typically, they've been doing it late. So they see a reduction of everything. They always, the, the tail has been, you know, the kind of the, the, the tail has been that because the neurons are not working, the vessels are not working. All right, but we are look. We want to look early on when you the vessels are, are the neurons are still working, but not perfectly, and and the vessels are starting to feel uh, to, to be a problem. I think so far a cell MRI maybe is a quantitative methods to assess blood flow. Most people use bold fMRI, which is not a good way to do it because you know bold depends upon a three separate variables that all of which could be affected by Alzheimer's disease. So if you see no change or an increase or a reduction, you're not going to know how to interpret. So th those are the, uh, and there is some data on, on early Alzheimer's disease showing neurovascular dysfunction exactly like in a mouse. So I don't know how good that is. I think the field is focused. That's what the subfield of, of, the, of, of, of Alzheimer interested in, in, in vessels are, are thinking that. But the majority of the community is going for circulating biomarkers, is going for tau, is going for a beta in the brain using PET. Uh, uh, that's kind of going to be, and for, in the United States, it's not reimbursed yet. So, so uh, it's really mainly for research purposes. And, yeah. uh, um, yeah. Perhaps, perhaps before we, we sum up, you know, there's one or two more questions concerning the inflammation. So Katie Rayner uh, noticed in your uh, proteomics data, Constantino, that, uh, that inflammation seems to be more associated with the uh, traditional AD rather than with the cerebrovascular uh, type. Uh, and so uh, do you think there are differences between vascular cognitive impairment and AD with regards to endocelial inflammation? 
And related to that, Chan Yung Yin also asked whether you included the coral plexus in your analysis because it obviously contains uh, quite a bit of vascular component that is affected. Pro the proteomic study was done. I didn't do the proteomic. I just wrote a little blurb. I didn't write the did a, didn't do the proteomic study, but that was prefrontal cortex. Okay. So it's not nothing to do with the coral plexus. Um, the now the, the, the that study really linked it to to atherosclerosis of the. So it's a correlative study between whether you got atero in your willis circle or in your MCA and what's is downstream of that and there is no obviously link uh, 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 signaling link between those right. so, yeah. now vascular inflammation can cause cognitive impairment i mean think about you know covid all right covid yeah. you know uh, people are, have been looking for the virus in the brain <laughs> it, they haven't found it and the only thing they can find is that the vessels are screwed up uh, i mean at least vis-a-vis -vis -vis the, the 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 csf sepsis major cause of, of uh, cognitive impairment, essentially make, caused by vascular inflammation, you know, things like that. So there is a, they can cause it, but whether the, the, proportion, the, the role that they play in garden variety Alzheimer, I mean, no one knows exactly. Uh, so the best bet is to do vascular health, to maintain vascular health and, you know, to pull all the stops with exercise and, you know, the, the stuff that nobody wants to do. Yeah. Everybody wants to pill. <laughs> All right. Well, they want to start for Alzheimer's disease so they can go eat, you know, they can do, uh, do what they want. Well, Tom, if you don't have any further uh, questions, so I, I think I would like to thank you and, and, and summarize, you know, for, for this really wonderful, inspired discussion that we had. And I think this uh, two talks and the discussion opened up a whole universe on the neurovascular uh, interface and its importance in, in, uh, in driving uh, cognitive uh, impairment and, and uh, disease. Yeah. Um, so, and uh, maybe also as a little side remark, I see there's many other questions that we couldn't uh, touch upon. So if you really would feel free to forward those uh, to the editorial office and they can be addressed and we can forward them to the um, to the two uh, presenters and then basically then you get some feedback on your on your remaining questions and I hope you can take the time and then and then look into that that would be wonderful well Tom do you have any well, thank you very much to both speakers for a very inspiring talks and really vivid discussion I think that the the, the quality of discussion was the, the proof how much Remarkable. it stimulated our neurons. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, maybe our cognitive uh, function is still kind of uh, hanging there. So, <laughs> wonderful. Thank you very so, much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. We're looking forward to the next cardiovascular. We have a slide about the And maybe one final slide from, from Sarah. Yeah. So, okay. Yes. Yes. Because this is something very uh, close to both uh, the council and also the cardiovascular research uh, hearts. Uh, please uh, basically join us at the Frontiers in Cardiovascular uh, Biomedicine meeting that will be a physical meeting uh, in uh, April 29 to May 1st in the wonderful city of Budapest. Uh, this has been postponed uh, several times, but now we have basically an updated and very exciting uh, program. So uh, you're most most welcome, you know, to join and um, and register still. Thank you very much. Submit your late breaking abstracts, by the way. It's still one more week to, week of time. And with this, I think if we go back and unchair. Thank you. Say goodbye. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Daniela. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. It was wonderful.